John. Hi, late night from Willowdale. Uh, I don't know it's the afternoon. <laughs> and uh, we want to do just a short video, and this will be short. I think the last one we, we kept pretty short, too. Um, just about the election results, uh, a bit about the Kurds and, and what the situation in, in, in northeastern uh, Syria. Um, uh, so, yeah, so uh, we didn't do a pre election video. We figured, what's the point? If everyone's election down, that's why I want to keep this one short. Everyone is election down, and I'm sure everyone's very happy it's over. Uh, so, um, the bottom line is there's not a lot of profound things to say, but there, there are a couple of things that I thought interesting that came out of Monday night and the speeches on Monday night. Um, first of all, obviously, the Liberals got smacked down, and uh, uh, they got a bit of comeuppance, as it were, uh, so they didn't get a majority. They got a strong minority, though. So the Liberals got punished. They deserve to get punished. Uh, they were, uh, Trudeau had become very arrogant on all sorts of different fronts, and uh, he deserved to get smacked down. I think obviously Canadians were, you know, a little scared of the Conservatives, and let's face it, the Liberals have done not a bad job running the country. The economy is doing reasonably well. Um, foreign, he's handled foreign affairs reasonably well. There, there are some, you know. So there are some problems there, but a lot of it not of his own making. The situation in, with China is really not of his own making. Um, uh, so we don't, I don't even go there, but uh, uh, he's handled the trade talks with Trump uh, well. So uh, um, I think he's done a reasonably good job. But yeah, he, he had become quite arrogant. Uh, and uh, you saw it on the campaign trail too. Like he, he would not. Reporters tried to ask him questions, and he wouldn't even answer them. He just had talking points, talking points, talking points. Uh, the other leaders were like that, too, but he was the worst. So the arrogance has just got too much. So he deserved that comeuppance. He deserved to get uh, uh, rebuked somewhat from the population, and he was, and he's got a minority government, and uh, I think it'll run for a while because nobody wants another election. Um, uh, saying that, um, uh, I thought there were a few moments that... Uh, uh, stood out on Monday night. Everyone commented, uh, and it hit me right away too, Jagmeet Singh, Jagmeet Singh's long, long speech. Um, uh, that way. And he, he's dancing around like he, Jagmeet, the NDP had won a majority. And every, a number of people have commented on this, how ridiculous this was. And, you know, the NDP lost a lot of seats and lost a lot of seats in Quebec. And, uh, but Jagmeet Singh was dancing around Monday night like he had won a majority government. Uh, the arrogance of that was incredible, and it was has been commented on by many people. Um, this is very typical of the NDP, by the way. This is one of the reasons I left the NDP. It's very cult-like. It's extremely cult-like, and uh, uh, and you know you can't stand those chants. NDP, NDP, NDP. You know it's just it's so irritating. I remember years ago when it when um, uh, I was working for a candidate. It was then Toronto Center, and the NDP candidate was running against Bob Ray, who was running for the Liberals, and he was trounced. He was absolutely trounced by Bob Ray. But I remember going to the election uh, get together afterwards, and people were shouting NDP, 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 just like um, they actually had won the, the by election, which of course they did not. They were trounced. And uh, I remember seeing Jack Layton on TV the next day claiming how great they did in Toronto Center. And of course, they were absolutely humiliated. And I thought, that's just, that is the arrogance of the NDP. That's one of the reasons a lot of people have left the NDP, people like me, and a lot of, <laughs> they just very cult-like, and it's very sort of, uh, yeah, I, that's all I can say. It's, uh, it's, it's weird. If you ever go to an NDP rally, you feel like you're in North Korea, you, you know. It's a uh, dear leader, and uh, oh my God. So yeah, so that was it, and that uh, that was a point that others have made. But yeah, the NDP's got to get some humility. Uh, Trudeau definitely needs humility. Humility, but sort of the NDP. Um, on uh, on the block, well, yeah, the block did really well. But the uh, the next day at the news conference, the block leader Blanchet was going on about how we will never have oil pipelines cross Quebec, and I thought. What arrogance, what incredible arrogance. How dare you? Don't people in Quebec drive cars? Don't they fly? You know, you need oil for, for, for lots of things. 
Like, I just couldn't believe it. And the fact that a lot of people in Quebec think that their energy is clean. Well, hydroelectricity is not clean. And uh, the Quebec government destroyed a lot of the James Bay lowlands to build the James Bay project and displaced a lot of people and it did real damage to the environment. So the hydroelectricity is not clean. Energy from James Bay is not clean. And uh, I find the hypocrisy of people in Quebec is just stunning, as represented in the block. Uh, yeah, so you just have to point that out. Um, uh, you know, uh, it's, you know, Quebec is a resource producing province, just like Alberta. And, uh, you know, you, you have to make compromises when it comes to the environment when you produce resources. But yes, hydroelectricity is not clean. Uh, it's in many ways as dirty as oil. And the, the hypocrisy of a lot of leaders in Quebec is stunning. Um, Okay, that goes to the um, that uh, brings me to the uh, the the pipeline. Um, you know, when you go, when you govern, you have to make compromises. So uh, Trudeau, I think, is honest by saying he wants to do something in the environment. But he, he he's the prime minister of a country that produces a lot of natural resources, and where ten percent of the economy is oil and gas. So uh, yeah, of course he's got to make compromises. And Alberta oil's got to get to the coast. So. Uh, what's the expansion of one pipeline? I don't just don't see this massive, crazy, over-the-top opposition. I'm glad that Trudeau's sticking with the pipeline. We're talking about expansion of one pipeline. Get over it. You know, obviously, oil should be phased out over time. Uh, and obviously, alternative energies are the best thing. You know, wind, solar, all sorts of other things. But, uh, you know, you're, we still need oil. So... You got to make compromise even when it comes to the environment and some of these climate change activists are just you know they're just outrageous and uh um i didn't find i found that uh when that young kid from sweden uh as a teenager from sweden came to canada i thought i thought it was a bit much um you know country of free speech obviously come and say what you want but i thought going to alberta and thumbing the nose at at uh basically the Alberta economy was a bit much, a bit arrogant. You know, given that uh, uh, next door to Sweden is Norway, a huge oil and gas producer. A big part of the Nor Norway's economy is oil and gas. So didn't have to travel all the way across the Atlantic to lecture ca Canadians about oil and gas. Canadians know the environmental consequences of oil and gas production. We don't need some 16-year-old kid from Sweden lecturing us on oil and gas production. Uh, we know it. Uh, if you, you know, she should just go next door to Norway and lecture them. That's in their neighborhood. Um, so yeah, one pipeline. I don't expansion of one pipeline. I I just don't see a big deal about it. Let's do it. Let's get it done. And I think people in Alberta have a right to be annoyed uh, about uh, about what's going on, especially when they hear those comments from leaders in Quebec. Um, and on the uh, you know, let me t talk about another sort of Canadian. Just a. Uh, a side, couple of side issues here. Um, uh, on election night, we went to a bar, uh, and they went. Uh, the hockey game was on. We asked them to turn the election results on, and they they didn't want to do it. And I said, "Well, hockey is not that important. Uh, uh, it's not playoffs or anything. It's October. Turn the election results on." And uh, they didn't want to do it because hockey is all important. It's all consuming. And this is where sports becomes a bit nutty. Okay. Uh, I understand during playoffs, and we we all got caught up with the Raptors and all that. And, uh, you know, I got caught up with the Blue Jays back in the day. But uh, let's keep sports in perspective, uh, especially when it's not playoff season. I think this bar, they eventually did turn the election results on. And of course, everybody was watching them. More people, I think, were interested in the election results in the hockey game, but no one wanted to say anything. Uh, let's keep sports in perspective. The ele Canada's po 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 politics and the election results are important. And they are more important than hockey. Uh, so uh, I'm get, I'm getting, I get annoyed when hockey is so over the top, all so pervasive, and the, all part of, so much part of Canadian society. It, I find that irritating. I don't, frankly, like being identified with hockey. You know, most of the people around the world identify Canadians with hockey. I don't like being identified with hockey. I'd rather be identified with other things uh, and not hockey. Um, uh, you know, so... Uh, Keep sports in perspective, you know. Uh, I think that's uh, I think that's important. Um, 
and on the other thing with the election, uh, uh, you know, affordable housing and everything, uh, so many people uh, find what goes on in politics is so far removed from the reality. There are so many people looking for affordable housing in our society. Like me. Like Cleve, looking for rooms to rent, uh, being exploited. Uh, and there's very, it's, it's hard to even find a room to rent like in the city of Toronto. And it's hard to find anything that's reasonable. Uh, and a lot of these landlords who rent rooms tend to be exploitive and nasty and overcharged. I mean, renting a room in the city of Toronto is like 700, between 600 and $800 for a room. That's outrageous, you know? Uh, so, you know, apartments, when this bachelor apartment is, 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 is less than that. And of course, I live in a housing co-op. Uh, you know, Justin Trudeau and Jagmeet Singh and all the rest of them, they have no conception of what people go through uh, who don't have, have limited income, have, have small incomes, what they go through to look for stable housing. And, uh, you know, they can, talk, they can talk all they want. It's just not happening. Um, people who are, just ask anyone who's looking for a place to rent or a uh, Forget an apartment, just a room, and how hard it is, and all the crap you have to put up with, and you have to put up with sleazy landlords who will gouge you and overcharge you, and it's just, yeah, for a lot of, that's why people become cynical about politics, because uh, uh, it's just for, 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 you know, a good chunk of society, and uh, in North America in particular, uh, finding just even a, a, a bit a stable housing or at least decent housing is almost impossible sometimes with when, when you have low incomes and the politicians who make very good money uh, have no conception of what people go through so that's another thing uh, okay so that's it uh, now just about about the Kurds um, now yeah uh, uh, it was good that I have I, ha I was very happy to see Al Baghdadi taken out to a real nasty vicious piece of work so uh, the world's a better place today because he's gone um, but that doesn't mean that here, that area of the world is going to be stabilized anytime soon. Um, I don't want to dwell on it. Uh, we've all we talked about the Kurds and how they've been betrayed um, so many times. And uh, um, I just wanted to read you. The Economist did a great piece on that, the whole situation in Syria and the Kurds. And uh, the Kurds, have, I told you in the last video a couple of weeks back that, you know, everyone knows the Kurds have been betrayed so many times in history. But uh, there's a classic one in 1975. Um, the CIA encouraged the CIA, Israel, the Shah of Iran. They encouraged, they encouraged, they encouraged the Kurds a Kurdish revolt in Iraq. They encouraged a Kurdish revolt in Iraq in mid 70s. In the mid 70s, they, the, the CIA encouraged, along with the Shah of Iran and Israel, encouraged a Kurdish revolt in northern Iraq to, to sap to sap the energy of, of, of the Ba'athist regime at the time, which I don't know if it was Saddam Hussein. I, it was some, I think it was someone else. But uh, the, the Iraqi regime at the time, I, I don't know who was in power in the mid-70s. But they encouraged the Kurds to revolt and, and uh, sap the energy of, 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 of the regime in Baghdad um, to destabilize it or what have you. And, uh, and then the Shah of Iran got tired of it, and uh, the Americans got tired of it, and they basically said, Screw the Kurds, and basically said to the Iraqis, "Do whatever, what, what, do whatever you want." So, you know, they so they stopped the the uh, support for this rebellion. The Kurds got betrayed, and the Iraqis went in there and basically slaughtered them. And of course, the Iraq uh, Saddam Hussein, the famous late '80s gassing. We all know about that. So, what, what did Kissinger say at the time after the? This is classic. This is what Kissinger said. At, Henry Kissinger said, he was Secretary of State, 1975. Said at the time. Uh, when they betrayed the when they betrayed the Kurds, he said, uh, 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 "This is after the Kurds were betrayed and getting slaughtered again by the Iraqis." Uh, I guess I can use this uh, word on fa on Facebook or whatever. He said, uh, "Fuck the Kurds, fuck the Kurds if they can't take a joke." Shrug, Mr. Kissinger. <laughs> That's what he said. He said, "Fuck." Yeah, actually, the he said, "Fuck the Kurds." Yeah, he said, "Fuck the Kurds if they can't <laughs> take a joke." After they've been slaughtered by the Iraqis, what, he, he was basically said, "What do you think we were serious? Uh, oh my God. Encouraging you to revolt?" And then when they were betrayed and getting slaughtered, Kissinger said, "Yeah, fuck the Kurds if they can't take a joke." That's wow. <laughs> Henry Kissinger, a real piece of work. Um, so that's that says it all about what people, you know, what Western countries think about the Kurds. You know, hmm. um, 
Uh, and Bush, uh, again, I mean, after the uh, war, the Gulf War, uh, 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 1991, they were encouraged to rebel again. Uh, but this time, at least, the, the Western powers put a no... F and again, sort of betrayed. Not as bad as the Shias were betrayed in southern Iraq. But uh, at least this time, the no-fly zone was put into northern Iraq. So uh, Saddam Hussein couldn't uh, do what he did in the 1980s. But uh, yeah, so they've been betrayed so many times. Uh, 75 was a classic, though. Um, yeah, Kurds can't take a joke. They just can't take a joke. What were, what were you thinking that we were going to support a revolt? You know? Yeah, anyways, it's uh, it's so horrible. That was a... Yeah, that was... That's a classic Kissinger moment. Um, uh, anyways, uh, I think that's it. There's probably a few other things, but again, with the video went on a bit... Do you think Canada should repatriate its citizens that that went to fight for ISIS? Oh, yeah, totally. If they're mm. Canadian, we repatriate them and incarcerate them, yeah. There you go. They're Canadian citizens. Yeah, and they shouldn't you know? be left to the Kurds. Yeah, they, yeah they, they shouldn't be left to, to rot in Syria. They're, they're, obviously, they're obviously screwed up, but... Uh, that's why we have a criminal justice system, and we're mm. obviously screwed up. Mm. Um, so, but yeah, of course, they're Canadian citizens. If we were repatriated and incarcerated, prosecuted, incarcerated, and rehabilitated, if some of them can if be rehabilitated. possible, yeah. yeah. So, uh, I don't know what's going to happen with ISIS. I don't know. this. They're not gone yet, and the situation in Syria is so unstable now, thanks to Trump. And uh, uh, I thought, I don't agree with, see, I wanted to end this video, but I agree with Trump. We got in. Uh, Americans need to withdraw from the world somewhat. Absolutely. This was working though in North uh, East Syria. This was working, and the Kurds had set up some sort of a, a stable situation there. And I, I agreed with that American footprint there. That was actually working. But yeah, of course the Americans got to get out of Afghanistan, and uh, they got to reduce their military presence. Absolutely. It's uh, Americans can't police the world. I agree with Trump on that one. You got to do it in a certain way though. Afghanistan one is a, is a tricky, tricky situation. The Taliban are nuts. They're no different than ISIS in many ways. They just seem to love killing people, uh, blowing up mosques, and the Taliban are nuts, okay? Um, uh, how do you deal with people who are psychotic like the Taliban? But you still have to, you know, at some point the Americans can't be there forever. Um, and there's got to be a way. you got to try to build up the Afghan government as much as possible. But uh, eventually you're going to have to go because uh, it's... This is not a stable... Yeah, the Americans have troops in Japan and South Korea, but these are stable s situations where the, the troops have their families with them and they're, they're stable. We have you know They have troops in Germany. These are stable situations. But Afghanistan's a war zone. The Americans aren't going to... Staying there is not going to make the thing, the Taliban, go away. They obviously have support within the country. Um, and uh, it's not... I don't think it's the West's job or the U.S.'s job or any... to. to to police Afghanistan. Eventually, they're going to have to solve their own problems. So, uh, uh, But yeah, the Taliban are nuts, and it's a tricky situation. What do you do with people who seem to enjoy just killing people? And I, don't get me wrong, not all the violence in Afghanistan comes from the Taliban. There's lots of collateral damage from U.S. drone strikes. There was one the other day that killed a bunch of people. So, uh, yeah, but I don't think people in the Pentagon are, are, are saying, okay, how many civilians are we going to kill today? No, they're not doing that, okay? Uh, but the Taliban do do that. No different than ISIS. They seem to just, they have no political program. They seem to just like enjoy killing people. So that makes this withdrawing from Afghanistan difficult, but can't stay there forever. The Afghans got to figure it out. And as I've said many times, it should be a regional solution. Uh, Pakistan is up to no good. And, well, now that the Russians are, you know, I mean, the Russians are in and there the Russians, now. Uh, How stable the Russians can it be want, with them? Yeah, yeah, I don't know if the Russians want to get back at, in Afghanistan. They had a rough time there. Mm. Uh, the Indians could be more helpful, and I think that's where you have to bring the Iranians in too. But anyways, that's for another video. We've done that. Let's just end it. Uh, uh, we got that. That that'll be it for a while on late night from Willowdale. Okay. Okay. All right.